A very good day, everyone. So in, in our last class, we covered uh, the asymptotic equipartition property. And there we looked at the law of weak numbers and then the law of large numbers. And then uh, said that the asymptotic equipartition property follows directly from the law of uh, large numbers or better still, the weak law of large numbers, such that the entropy follows directly uh, from the independent and identically distributed random variables. And then uh, we're able to also consider the typical set, okay? And then said, well, that the typical set is a very small distribution or it's a, a small sample space within the entire distribution that is able to give sufficient information to give an approximation to the entropy. Okay. And also, uh, we're also able to show that the Asymptotic equipartition property, say AEP, says that if, for instance, we have random variables x1, s2, all the way that are independent and identically distributed with a probability distribution p of x then we have negative one over n log the probability distribution s2 all the way to sn tending to the entropy in probability And be that as it may, uh, we were also able to therefore come up with a question that if we are able to approximate some independent and identically distributed random variables having some probability distribution function, what happens if we have dependent variables, not independent this time? And that is where we are going to take off uh, from this time. To we'll talk about the entropy rate. So the entropy rate of a given sequence of random variables is a measure of the growth of the entropy, okay? And then we usually denote this as H of X. Because here we want to consider that the random variables are dependent. So since there exists some level of dependence in say, the random variable S of I, then the entropy of the stochastic process, say S of I, will therefore be defined as H of S, taking limit from N as N becomes sufficiently large, one over N, H of X one, S2 all the way to Sn when the limit exists, okay? So interpretively, the entropy H of X is the limit of the joint entropy of N, of N number of elements or of processes in the random variable divided by n 
as this n tends to infinity as it becomes sufficiently large. So what we are trying to say here is that the entropy rate is seen to be the best achievable data compression. And considering the level of dependence, so if we now consider the Markov chain, for instance, the Markov chain. So we have that a stochastic process, S of i, is an index sequence of random variables for which there can be, say, an arbitrary dependence among the random variables, such that the process is characterized by the joint probability distribution, okay? So we can therefore say that the probability distribution of x1, s2, all the way to Sn is the same as the distribution of S1, S2, all the way to Sn, which is the same as the probability of X1, S2, all the way to Sn, given the distribution, given that, given that X1, S2 all the way to Sn are elements in the random variable or in the stochastic process. So the stochastic process is said to be stationary if the joint distribution of any subset of this sequence of the random variable is invariant with respect to shift in the time index. So in other words, there is no change in this in the in the level of uncertainty with respect to time. So that is uh, the probability of this stochastic process S of one being the same as S one, S of two being the same as S two, all the way to S of n being the same as S n, for instance, is the same. Should there be a shift in time, then S sub one plus L will also be the same as S sub one, meaning it is time invariant. Okay, does this no sh shift in time does not affect this process? So S sub two plus L will be the same as S two, all the way to S sub n plus L will also be the same as S n. So should we have a process having this probability distribution, then we say it is a stationary stochastic process. So such a process is a stationary stochastic process. That is the joint distribution any subsets. Now, these are subsets, right? These are subsets. These are subsets of the entire distribution, okay? These are subsets. So any subset of the sequence of the random variable is invariant. It doesn't change with respect to shift in the time index. So you see that as we, as we shifted the time index from one to one plus L, the elements still remain the same as X1. Okay, that's what we mean. So should we have a process having this distribution, then we say it is stationary, okay? And uh, an example of a stochastic process is the Markov chain in which each random variable depends only on the one preceding it. You know, if you remember, x, y, z. So now you look at this, looking at this process, you see that y depends on x. Y, z 
have some conditional independence on x, z, and x. So, but z is directly dependent on y. Okay, so we now say that uh, a stochastic process, an example of a, uh, of, of a stochastic process is this Markov chain, where each random variable depends only on the one preceding it. Okay, this depends on this, this depends on this, and, and it's conditionally independent of all other preceding elements in this uh, process. So here we say that this stochastic process uh, is a stochastic process with dependence. There's some level of dependence, okay? Because here we can say that here the probability distribution of Y given X, okay? Why here we say the probability of Z given Y. So there's a level of dependence between Z and Y. There's some level of dependence between Y and Z. And should Z have any information about X, it must first learn Y. So it, Z is not directly dependent on X, but on Y. So this is a stochastic process with dependence. So, so we say this is a stochastic, stochastic process with dependence. And then we can now say that a stochastic process, say x1, s2, all the way, is said to have a Markov chain, say x1, s2, all the way, is said to have that Markov chain, or a Markov process, if for all n being the same as 1, 2, all the way, that this probability distribution exists such that Sn plus one is the same as the probability that Xn plus one occurs given that Xn uh, has uh, occurred or better still been transmitted, okay? And therefore this also is therefore the same as Sn, okay? And then we have that Sn, this, uh, minus one will be the same as Sn minus one, all the way, that's cap S, okay, for the random process. For the random, or for the stochastic process. Sn minus one, then all the way to S1 being the same as S1. Now this will now be the same as the probability because this is now conditional because there's some level of dependence. Sn plus one will be the same as the probability of Sn plus one given that Sn, which is the same as Sn has occurred for all values of S1, S2, all the way to Sn, then Sn plus one being elements in the stochastic process. So the joint probability mass function of the random variable can now be written as the joint distribution, S1, S2, all the way to Sn, so that we have the probability of x1 times, recall uh, a stochastic process, if this is p of x1, at this point, we have p of x2 given x1 all the way, okay? So this process will now give us this times probability of x2 given that x1 already occurred, times the probability of x3 given that s2 already occurred, times the probability of x4, given that x3 already occurred all the way to probability of Sn, given that Sn minus one already occurred. So this gives us that level, of, it shows that level of dependence. So the Markov chain is said to be time invariant if the conditional probability say P of Xn plus one given Sn 
does not depend on n. This does not depend on n. For all values of n, taking on values from one to all the way. Okay, so what, what this means therefore is that the probability distribution, say Sn plus one, such that B is say uh, received when Sn equal to A was transmitted will be the same as the probability distribution of S2, for instance, which is the same as B, given that S1 equal to A was transmitted for all A and B being elements of the stochastic process. Okay. And from this, we can now say that if the stochastic process S of I it's a Markov chain, for instance. This is a Markov chain or forms a Markov chain. Then Sn is called the state at time n. And from this, we can now say that a time invariant Markov chain is characterized by its initial state and the probability matrix. Okay, and uh, as we get into uh, channel capacity, we'll begin to play with the probability matrix, which shows that level of dependence. Okay, we already we already mentioned something like that while talking about Markov chain, so that the probability matrix here will be the probability of y given that x has occurred. Okay, uh, so now. We now have this for i and j being elements taking on values of one, two, all the way to some integer. Where p i j is the same as the probability distribution of x n plus one, which is equal to j, given that x n equal to i has occurred, which is the same as this probability matrix, okay? So we call this probability matrix. Probability matrix. Mm -hmm. So now, if the largest common factor of the length of different parts from a state to itself is one, then the Markov chain is said to be a periodic, okay? And that is uh, from x to y. So the difference between this and this is just one, okay? So from this to z, it is one, okay? So uh, now, if the largest common factor of the length of different parts, okay, from a state to itself, so moving from this part to this part, this part to this part, this part to this part, okay, uh, or this part of this part or this part of this part is one, then the Markov chain is said to be a periodic Markov chain, okay? And if it is possible to go with positive probability from any state of the Markov chain to any other state, so that uh, P of Y given X from this to this, then P of Z given Y is positive, okay? So then we say it is irreducible. So if it is possible to go with positive probability from any state of the Markov chain to any other state in a finite number of steps, then the Markov chain will be said to be irreducible, okay? Said to be irreducible. Now, if the probability mass function of the random variable at say n, is P of Xn. This is the probability mass function. And then the probability mass function at time n plus one would therefore be P of Sn plus one, which would be the same as sigma P of Sn, 
then P of S n, S n plus one for all values of S n. And a distribution on the states such that the distribution at time n plus one is the same as the distribution, is the same as the distribution at n, that is P of S n plus one is the same as the distribution P of S n then we say that it is stationary. It's a stationary distribution, okay? Now, this is so because if the initial state of a Markov chain is drawn according to a stationary distribution, then the Markov chain itself forms a stationary process. And if we now have finite state Markov chain, which is, which we can actually, which we can say is a periodic and irreducible for instance, then the stationary distribution is unique. And from any starting distribution, the distribution of Sn will definitely tend to a stationary process as n becomes sufficiently large. So given this, we can therefore say that if we have a sequence, if we have a sequence of n random variables, for instance, then the entropy of the sequence, the entropy of the sequence, let's designate this properly, but we're talking about a stochastic process. The entropy of a sequence will grow with n by a factor defined by the entropy rate. And therefore, we can now define the entropy rate as n becomes sufficiently large to be the average value of the joint distribution, S1, S2, all the way to Sn. And if, for instance, we say that S1, S2 are independent and identically distributed random variables, then the entropy rate will be given as limit the joint entropy S1, S2 all the way to Sn divided by n will be the same as limit n h of x1 as we described in uh, AEP, asymptotic equipartition property, we now reduce to the entropy, which is expected, right? As entropy rate per symbol, okay? So this now gives us the entropy rate Per symbol. And for a sequence of independent but not identically distributed random variable, we can therefore say that the joint entropy is the same as the sum summation one to n h of si. And you should note that this H of SI are not equal because they are independent, but are not identically distributed. Okay, so if they were identically distributed, they will be equal, but this time they are not equal. So uh, alternatively, we can actually put this as uh, that the entropy rate is the same when we take limit for n to be sufficiently large, h of s, because of the level of dependence. So we get our conditional entropy, comma, Given that this has occurred and also Sn minus 2 has occurred all the way to S1. Okay. When the limit exists, which is insufficiently large. And here you will know that this entropy rate is the conditional entropy of the last random variable given the past, given the past, okay? Because this is 
Sn, which is the last random variable, given that all of these as a whole. Why h of x is the per symbol entropy of n random variables? Okay, this is per symbol. Entropy of n random variables. Now, if we now consider a stationary process, then h of x will be the same of h prime of x. And for a stationary Markov chain, the entropy rate will therefore reduce to h of x being the same as h prime of x, taking on the limit h of that's n sufficiently large of so Sn, given that Sn minus one, Sn minus two, comma, all the way to Sn has a chord or S1, let's put it appropriately for this Sn from the, this is the last symbol from the first symbol is the same as taking on the limit for n sufficiently large. So Sn, given that Sn minus one already occurred, which is this. So this, this are equal for a stationary process. So this will be the same as H of S, so given that S1 has occurred. Where the conditional entropy is evaluated using stationary distribution. So this we say, stationary for a stationary Markov chain. Okay. Okay. And then we go on and on. Now, uh, why this? Our fundamental goal is data compression. Okay. Data compression. This are fundamental goal. And now we have considered both identically distributed independent random variables and dependent random variables. So uh, to put things more formally, what is data compression? Now you will recall that the entropy is the data compression limit itself, okay? And now if the, if, if the entropy is the data compression limit, data compression limit, how then can we evaluate this limit given certain distributions? Okay. So our random variables could be independently distributed or dependently distributed, okay? So when there's some level of dependence, then we can't help but to evaluate using the Markov chain, okay? And then we know that whichever way, going by the distribution, our goal is to figure out the minimum number of bits, number of bits on average, that will be able to represent that source symbol before transmission or storage. So that's the goal. So the goal of data compression technically is to remove redundancy. We want to remove redundancy. And for us to be able to do that, then we should be able to compress the bit. So data compression therefore can be achieved by, 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 by uh, assigning short descriptions to the most frequent outcomes of the data source. So if we have some source symbols occurring more frequently, then uh, say A, B, C, A, D, B, A, C, C. Now, if, for instance, we have something like this. So when we look, A 
is repeated twice. B is also repeated twice. C is repeated three times. And okay, A is also repeated three times. And D is repeated once. So what I'm actually trying to say in data compression is we can actually represent A, A, B, because A is repeated three times. B is repeated how many times? Two times. C is repeated three times. Then D is repeated just once. So we now look at this. So the source symbols that are repeated more frequently can be described or represented using shorter length description. When we say shorter length description, we mean minimum bits. Say for this, we say, well, we want to represent this with just, say, one. Okay, anywhere we have A, we just put one bit. Now, anywhere we have D, well, we can just use, okay, let's, then a C, we want to represent C with a zero, okay? Now for B, well, uh, it's not as frequent. Let's say we represent it with one zero. Then for D, we can represent with a, with a longer length, okay? Say uh, uh, zero, one, zero, okay? So that when we now encode this entire process, rather than, uh, let's, let's wipe this part. Okay, uh, let us wipe this part. So rather than, let's assume for all of this, let's say um, going by standard A, B, C, D, they are represented by say four bits, say this zero, zero, zero. Okay, let's say three, uh, let's say four bits, zero, zero, zero. This is represented as 0001. This is represented as 0010. And this is represented by, say, um, 0011 by standard. So it means that if we want to represent A, B, C, so we have 0000, B, 0001, C, we have 0010, then A, 0000. D, we have 0011. B, we have 0001. Then A, we have 0000. Then C, we have 0010, 0010. But now we want to say, well, now that we want to do compression, data compression can be achieved by assigning short descriptions to the most frequent outcomes of the data source. And, log and longer description to the less frequent outcome. So let me write that down. Uh, let's change the color so that we now go back to. So what we are trying to say is that data compression may be achieved by assigning short descriptions to the most frequent outcomes of the data source and longer description So the less frequent outcomes. So what I'm trying to say is now, you look at this using this uh, code book, but now we want to say, well, we have some uh, more frequent outcomes here. A uh, is repeated three times, C repeated three times. So one represent them with just one and zero. So once we see a one, we know, once we see a one, we know it's A. Once we see a zero, we know it's C. Now let us repeat this. So what are we going to get for this same uh, process? So 
We have A, that is one. We have B, one, zero. We have C, zero. We have A, one. We have D, zero, one, zero. We have B, one, zero. We have A, one. Then we have C, zero, zero. Now you can tell how compressed this is. In other words, we have eliminated some level of redundancy, okay? And then for us to also decode this in terms of er error correction and decoding, well, we should be able to develop some efficient codes for this. But technically, before we transmit this information, we have been able to compress the data by assigning shorter description lengths to the more frequent symbols and longer description lengths to the less frequent symbols, unlike this entire process. Now, you know that if we have to transmit this, we'll require more bandwidth than this. So this is the beauty of data compression, okay? So for us to now be able to estimate the effective length, this description length, that brings us to the effective length, okay? How do we tell the length of code word, okay? Because in this case, we're saying these are all code words describing this symbol. How do we tell the effective length, the most efficient of this length to describe each symbol in that sequence for data compression, okay? So if we now say that, uh, da, 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 da. if we now say that C of X, for instance, is the code word, let's say this is the code word, corresponding to S sub one. And then L of X denotes the length of the code word, okay? The length of the code word, for instance. Then the expected length, the expected length that will give us that description length to describe each symbol is therefore given as L of C, which is the same as the expected value of the length of each code word, such that X is an element of the stochastic process, okay? Now, you will observe that this expected length actually gives us the average code word length. This gives us the average code word length. So it is the average number of bits required to encode each symbol. It is the average number of bits required to encode each symbol from the source using a specific encoding okay. algorithm, okay? So where this is the length of the code word as we have said, and this is the probability of occurrence of each code word, probability of occurrence of each code word. Now, uh, well, if you've been following through and probably thinking very deeply, uh, something will be confusing right now. You know, we thought entropy was all about it. So why expected length? And now we know that the entropy is the minimum number of bit on average. So how come the average code word length again? 
But now you will, you will, you will, you will agree with me that the entropy is more like the theoretical limit. Okay? Because the entropy provides the theoretical lower bound on the average code word length. But the expected length provides the actual average code word length produced by the encoding algorithm. Okay? So, uh, uh, technically, the entropy should be less than or equal to the expected length. Okay, because the entropy tells us the minimum average number of bits needed to encode each symbol from the source. So this is giving us the minimum average needed. Why this is giving us the actual number of symbols needed. Okay, so I need you, I need also that we don't confuse these two concepts, okay? And as we move forward, we now begin to see, we'll see the importance. Because if we want to check out for optimal codes, then uh, we now have to compare the expected length with the entropy. So that gives us the code efficiency, which is the ratio of the entropy to the expected length, okay? So the closer, so unity it is, the more optimal the code, okay? So that the redundancy will now be the same as one minus the code efficiency, okay? So it means that the more the efficiency, the less the number of redundant bits we have. So the more compressed the source symbol that we'll have to transmit over the channel or better still store in a storage device. I don't know if that makes any sense. So I think I want to I want to get your feedback now. Is that clear at all? Before I progress. Yes, sir. It makes sense. Okay. Okay. So now, uh, thank you for that. So uh, now, for us to move on, you will you will recall that we made mention of a communication process. So let's assume this is a communication process, and then this is the channel, and then this is the receiver. So this is the source, and then this is uh, the destination or the trans or, or the or the receiver. But let's just put it as a destination. Now, uh, it could be the other way around, okay? It could be a transceiver, but let's just stick with... Uh, uh, a unidirectional system, okay? Where we have to transmit and then receive. Now, this is the channel. This is the channel, okay? So at this point, we do data compression. Because I, I I need us to because I, I just I need us to get something clear right now at this point okay so here we are doing data compression because we want to reduce the number of bits that we can transmit over this channel because we already know what Shannon said that this rate at which we are transmitting should be less than the capacity of the channel if we must guarantee error-free or near error-free transmission. But now, once we are able to do this, this does not, now this data compression does not protect or guarantee the integrity of the symbols being transmitted. So for us to be able to do this, there are algorithms to do this, okay? We have algorithms. We'll talk about some of them, okay? Algorithms for data compression. Okay, so the idea is that we just want to achieve this limit. We want to ensure that we have at least, we are able to represent what we want to transmit with minimum number of bits. And we have been able to also establish that for us to be able to do that, we need to provide 
uh, the expected length of this uh, of each symbol of the of the expected length of each symbol. That is the the actual number of bits we need to use to represent each symbol for transmission. And there's a way we now have to design the algorithm such that we look at the symbols that are, you know, uh, that are more uh, in terms of repetition and then represent them with a shorter description length, meaning minimum number of uh, bits in their code word, in the code word representing those symbols. And those that represent, that, that occur less often, well, we can use a longer length for them so that we're able to compress. And once we are able to do this, the source or the transmitter and the receiver will be aware of this algorithm, okay? Because whatsoever algorithm we use for encoding, we have to be uh, known to the receiver so it will be able to decode it, okay? Yeah, so there's some level of reciprocity between the transmitter and the receiver, okay? So that my receiver needs to be aware of my encoding algorithm because this is encoding algorithm to be able to decode, okay? So we now have the decoding algorithm, okay? So uh, is this a reciprocal function? So we are taking the inverse operation of the encoding process to decode, okay? So that's why if, for instance, I have X coming this way, so once I have S inverse, I'll be able to decode, okay? So this is a decoding process, this is an encoding process. That's fine. But for also be able to ensure the, or guarantee the integrity or the reliability, let's say the reliability of what is being transmitted, then we have to do channel coding, okay? So we have the channel coding algorithms too. Okay, so this now, are strictly for error detection and correction, okay? So it means that once we have done our compression, that's fine, that's from the source. But in the channel, we also have another algorithm running that will be able to correct for errors and detect those errors, okay? And usually this algorithm runs in the receiver, okay? It's running somewhere in the receiver. But once it receives it, then it's able to, you know, look through this process, but the, uh, 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 the, the, but the encoder also will be aware, okay? Because we are going to initiate this uh, error control technique also. But what I wanted to understand is that here we have the source, the source coding technique and the channel coding technique, okay? So right now, now that we are talking about data compression, we are now going to move into this source coding technique. But for us to be able to encode, or better say, do data compression, there's more to it. Can we just use random codes like I assigned in the previous example and just said A is zero, uh, this is one, this is one zero? No, we can't do that because if we should use some random codes, so encode, then we may run into the decoding, we may run into some decoding problems because at the instance where we encode, we should be able to decode. So that brings us to uniquely decodable codes. Okay, so there are some codes that are not uniquely decodable. So it means that the, the, the particular code that we are going to use for data compression needs to possess some functions it needs to possess some parameters or metrics or characteristics, let's put it that way. And some of those characteristics now tells the type of code that we want to use. So it means that I can't just use some random codes, okay? So this code that we want to use for our compression over this, that, that we will transmit over this channel have to possess some properties. So what kind of codes are they? So this is going to bring us to defining some codes, the non-singular codes, the extension of codes, uh, uh, uniquely de decodable codes, and prefix-free, or better say prefix or instantaneous codes. So from there, we now do a few analysis and then go into um, uh, source coding algorithms, okay? Now, 
uh, knowing that the source coding algorithm is going to give us the actual uh, mi uh, the actual minimum number of bits on average that will be used to describe the symbols. Okay, so that we now know find if we have to transmit this uh, uh, for it to for 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 for, for the code words used to represent the symbols that are being transmitted or stored in some remote location to be uh, uh, received and decoded effectively then the code or the code word must be this for this. Okay, so it means that A must have a particular code word, B also must have a particular code word, C must have a particular code word all the way. So that once the, uh, uh, the transmitter is aware of this and the receiver is also aware of this, it will be very easy to decode this. And should we now integrate the uh, uh, error control capability then uh, we now have a robust communication process. Okay. So uh, one thing you should also take note of is that it is either we are storing or we are transmitting, okay? So whichever way, so we want to process our data or compress it so that we can store it or we transmit it. Just that we use this simple analogy to represent the channel. So if that's what it is, then what kind of codes can we actually uh, adopt for data compression so as not to run into uh, decoding problems? So let us define those kinds of codes. So the first of them is the non-singular codes. So uh, here we have that and this is a code in which no two distinct symbols are encoded to the same code word. So in other words, if I have A, B, C, D, I cannot use 0, 1, and 0, 1 for A, B, and then say 1, 1, 1, 0, no. So if we do this, then these are non-singular codes because uh, we cannot say they are non-singular. If they are non-singular, so it means that we cannot repeat the same code word for two symbols in this distribution. So, so it means that uh, so it means that uh, this is a code in which no two distinct symbols are encoded the same code word. So what we are trying to say is that each symbol has a unique representation. In the encoded form thereby ensuring that the decoding process is unambiguous, okay? And uh, as such, we say that the non-singular codes are essential for reliable communication since they prevent errors and loss of information during transmission or storage because no two symbols have identical code word, okay? But um, this is speaking loosely, okay? So uh, uh, now, uh, uh, technically speaking, the code is therefore said to be non-singular if every element or better as the symbol of the range of X maps into a different 
string in the asterisk, okay? Now, such that x is not the same as s star. And this implies that the code word for x is not the same, or let's just, uh, let me let me put it as, let me use the inverse operation. It's not the same as this. It's therefore not the same as the code word for s prime. So what we are trying to say is that the non-singular code is a one-to-one -one mapping, okay? Which is sufficient for unambiguous decoding, okay? And you, 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 you also have to note that the decoding is the inverse mapping, just like I already mentioned, okay? So this gives us a clear view of non-singular codes. So we now know that, fine, if we want to do data compression, Depending on the total number of symbols we want to use to describe the sequence that has to be uh, compressed, each symbol will have to have a unique code word. So if that happens, then we have non-singular codes. Then the next property we want to also consider, which gives us another type of code, is extension of codes, okay? Extension of codes. And it is the process of designing a larger code from a given code, okay? So we say, okay, let's maximize uh, this. I say this is the process of designing a larger code from a given code, okay? And for us to be able to do this, we could either perform an extension of the code, so by repeating it, okay? So we can achieve this either by repetition, okay? So in this case, we repeat each symbol, or bits of the original code multiple times, okay? So another way we could achieve extension of course is through concatenation. Okay? And in this case, it involves concatenating the original code with another code. So here we concatenate the original code with another code, okay? So uh, from this, we say that the extension, let's say the extension uh, code C of star, of a code C, for instance, is the mapping from finite length string of the stochastic process to finite length string or strings of D defined by, say, C of X1, S2, all the way to Sn will now be the same as C of X1 concatenated with C of S2, all the way concatenated with C, with C, sorry with C of Sn, okay? And here, let's assume we have C of X1 to be the same as zero one, and then C of S2 to be the same as one zero, 
then c of x1, c of, oh, what am I doing? Concatenated with c of s2 is going to give us 0, 1, 1, 0, okay? It's more like extending the code, okay? So uh, another way is to add parity, okay? Add parity check bits, okay? So once we add parity check bits, then the original bit becomes uh, longer than uh, or larger than. Then we also could uh, achieve this extension of code by increasing the symbol size, increasing the symbol size. Okay, and uh, this involves increasing the number of bits per symbol in the original code. So, for instance, we want to convert a binary code to a quaternary code. Okay, so what we're actually doing is that the bits per symbol of each of the codes of, of each of the symbols is increased. So, these are some ways we could perform extension of codes, but conventionally, uh, we want to adopt concatenation. So long these codes that we are concatenating satisfies the non-singularity function or, or property, okay? That no two symbols should have, you see that uh, uh, C of S1 and C of S2 have different code words representing them, okay? So they are non-singular. So another property that we also want to consider for you know, for also be able to adopt a particular code for data compression is that the code should be uniquely decodable. Okay. So we need to have uniquely decodable codes. Okay. So uh, and here we say that a uniquely decodable code should be non-singular and should also satisfy the extension of code property. So uh, technically, this code possesses the property that ensures that a sequence of encoded symbols can be uniquely decoded without any ambiguity. So it means that should we see some, should we receive certain code word the receiver should be able to tell that this code word belongs to this symbol, okay? So it means that a uniquely de decodable code ensures that no code word is a prefix of another code word, okay? So it means that a uniquely decodable code ensures that no code word is a prefix of another code word. So because this allows for unambiguous decoding of the encoded symbol. Now, what do we mean by prefix? So let's assume A is one, then B is one zero. You now realize that we have one here and zero here. It means that A is a prefix of B. Okay, now since A is a prefix of B, we could run into some confusion. Then let's assume we now have a C that is a zero, which is a suffix of B. So technically, should we transmit a B, the decoder may confuse this one zero for A, C instead of B. So when the decoder is supposed to be Decoding to say, well, B was transmitted is going to give us a C, which is wrong. So in other words, a uniquely, a, 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 a uniquely decodable code ensures that no code word is a prefix of another code word. Okay, then it means it is uniquely decodable. So here we now have that 
a code is said to be uniquely decodable if it is, or better still, if its extension, let's put it that way, if its extension, no, if its extension is non singular. So this is the extension here, for instance. So we must ensure that it is not singular. We must ensure that it is non-singular because uh, then it means that A, we have to take a code word of one, one, and then this could take uh, a code word of zero, one points. So it means that the, these codes have unique code words. So should I receive one zero, for instance, Automatically, my receiver knows that this is symbol B. What if I receive a one one? Then I know it is A. If I should receive a zero one, then it means. So now, uh, what if we have extension of this? So one one zero one. Okay. So we can easily decode A B, but we are going to come into this so that we don't run into confusion. Okay. Because right now I have one one perfect zero one. Perfect. This is C. Okay, this is C. AC. Okay, so it means we have AC. Okay, so it means that its extension is non singular. Okay. Okay. And then one final property we need to look at, which is uh, instantaneous code or proof is free. Now, some uh, tests will say that uniquely decodable codes and instantaneous or previous free codes are the same. They mean the same, but there's actually a slight difference because the instantaneous code or previous code is a uniquely decodable code, okay? Now, let us, uh, let us put it this way. Instantaneous code. We also call them prefix code, okay? So this is a uniquely decodable code where no code word is a prefix of any other code word. And also, no code word is a proper mm -hmm. suffix of any other code word. This means that each code word uniquely identifies a message symbol without the need to look ahead or backtrack to say, well, uh, this code is confusing, okay? It's actually telling us something else. So um, here we can now say that a code is said to be prefix-free or instantaneous or an instantaneous code if no code word is a prefix of another code word. And then you see that no code word can be formed by adding code symbols to another code word. So in instantaneous codes, each symbol can be decoded as soon as the corresponding code word is complete. And uh, that is, uh, it is not necessary to see bits of later symbols in order to decode the current one. So um, you should also note that a uniquely decodable code is said to be instantaneous 
if it is possible to decode each code word in a sequence without referencing uh, the succeeding one. Okay. So now that we have been able to identify some codes or some properties uh, yeah. that define certain codes uh, that we can adopt for source symbol compression or for data compression. Now, there is a sufficient condition to check for the uniquely decodability of a code, okay? So what is that condition? So we'll look at that condition briefly, okay? The condition to check for the uniquely decodability of a code. And that condition is the craft inequality. Okay? It's a craft inequality. And what does it say? Now, uh, the craft inequality states that for any instantaneous code or preferred pre-code over an alphabet of size D, for instance, where in our case, D is the same as two because we are considering binary digits, the code word length must satisfy this condition. Submission, the sigma, the negative Li, less than or equal to one. Where L sub I is the code word length Okay, and then D is the alphabet size, our alphabet size, where in our case, it is two for binary digits, for binary digits, right? For binary digits or bits. which we can say bits, okay? And you now see that if we are given a set of code word lengths that satisfies this inequality, then it means that we have instantaneous code, okay? So if, for instance, we have a set of code words that satisfies this, then it means an instantaneous code exists, okay? Now, what if we are given infinite prefix code? So if, for instance, we have infinite prefix code, there is an extension to this. So we now have to talk about the extended craft inequality. And it states that for any countable infinite set of code words, for any countable infinite set of code words that forms a prefix code, then the code word length must satisfy the, the, the extended craft inequality. The code word length must satisfy the extended craft inequality which is now the same as sigma i taken on value from one to infinity, then the i less than or equal to one. And conversely, if we have L1, L2 ranging to some, you know, arbitrary value, satisfying the extended craft inequality, 
we can actually construct a prefix code with the code word length. And also, we now have the Kraft Macmillan uh, inequality. The Kraft Macmillan inequality, which describes the summation of the alphabet length to the power of the length negative value. Recall what we have previously is also negative. Let's see, what do we have? What did we put there as the show? Yeah, it's negative, okay. So, uh, good. It's less than or equal to one. So this states that the code word length of any uniquely decodable DRA code must satisfy this inequality, okay? Now, it says that the code word length of any uniquely decodable DRA code must satisfy the craft map Milan inequality. So in other words, given a set of code word lengths that satisfies this inequality, it is possible to construct uniquely decodable codes of this code length. So, um, so from this, we can actually describe the consequence of um, of the Macmillan, of the Kraft Macmillan inequality. And the first is that if this inequality holds strictly, so if it holds with strict inequality, for instance, then the code has some redundancy. Now, what if it holds with strict equality? So if it holds with strict equality, then we say that the, the code is a complete code. And then the code is a complete code. So it, it describes uh, a uniquely decodable code. So what if it does not hold? Now, if it does not hold, then the code is not uniquely decodable. So let us look at one simple example, which we already played with earlier, and then uh, move on to something more interesting. So let's assume we have uh, this code, say S sub I, then we have code A, code B, code C, then code D. So let's, uh, let's get some straight lines. Let's get some straight lines. So let's say. So I have one. Okay. So let us say we have symbol X1, S2, S3, S4, right? 
And here we have 0, 0 for S1 for code A, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Then for code B, for S1, we have 0. For S2, we have 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. And for code C, we have 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. Then for code D, then we have 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. So now we have about four codes, but we want to use these four codes to describe the symbols, right? So which would be the best? Recall I made mention of one thing that we can't just use some random codes to describe the symbols, okay? So we want to be sure, are these codes non-singular? Do they satisfy the extension of code property in terms of concatenation? Now, are they uniquely decodable? Are they instantaneous codes, okay? But the kraft macmillan inequality gives us that parameter to use. And there it says that, well, this inequality should hold for us to be able to have com a complete code. Now, if we must have a complete code, then equality must hold. But the fact that there is equality does not mean that the code is uniquely decodable. So we now have to check. But looking at this, we can see that, okay, this is zero, zero. This is zero, one. This is, this is zero, one, one, zero, one, one. So no code is a prefix of another code here. So we may not have problems with code A. So let us move on to the next by inspection. Here we have zero. We have one, zero. We have one, 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 zero. Ooh. In code B, X3 is a prefix of X4, okay? Here, X3 is a prefix of X4 because we have 110, okay? So we are going to have issues with this code. Now let us go to code C. This is zero. This is 11100110, okay? Now S2 is a prefix of X4. So we are also going to have issues with code C, okay? Now, by inspection, okay, we are just looking at this, but we don't know if they will satisfy the Macmillan inequality, uh, craft in the, uh, the, the Macmillan craft inequality. So this is one condition, but this also, what we are doing is another condition. So if it satisfies this, but does not satisfy the non-singularity, then we cannot use that because it's not going to be uniquely decodable. Now, uh, looking at this, is zero, this is 1001101111. Zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, one. Okay, so there's no prefix, no code is a prefix of another one here. So let us try to resolve this. Let us evoke the uh, Kraft Macmillan inequality to see if, uh, to see which of these codes will be best in describing this code word should we attempt data compression or desire to attempt data compression. Okay, so let us look at code A. Now for code A, we have. Sigma i is the same as one, where one, two, three, four symbols. And we already know the alphabet size is two because we are dealing with binary, then negative L sub i, the code word length, okay? Now for x1, the code word length is what? It's two, right? So that is two to the power of minus two plus for S2, the code word length is 2, 1, 2. We have two bits there. 2 to the power of minus 2 plus for S3, the code word length is 2 also. We have two bits, 2 to the power of minus 2 plus S4, 2 to the power of minus 2. So this is the same as 1 over 2 over 2, 2 to the power of 2 plus 1 over 2 to the power of 2 plus 1 over 2 to the power of 2 plus 1 over 2 to the power of 2. So this is the same as 1 over 4 plus 1 over 4 plus 1 over 4 plus one over four, that is equal to one. Whoa. So now this code satisfies the kraft macmillan inequality. And going by the three conditions we gave, this is a complete code. It is a complete code. It does not have redundancy, right? It is a complete code. And by inspection, no code is a prefix of the other. It is also prefix-free. It is prefix-free. 
And also, it is uniquely decodable. So we can actually use this bit distribution to represent these symbols should we attempt data compression. Now, let us look at code B. So by evoking the craft macmillan inequality, one to four, two to four minus L1, L sub i, then the code length here is one, that's two to the power of minus one, plus two to the power of minus two, we have two here, two bits, plus two to the power of minus two, then the third bit here, one to three, if we have three bits, two to the power of minus three. So this is going to give us one over two plus one over two to the power of two plus one over two to the power of two plus one over two to the power of three. That's one over two plus one over four plus one over four plus one over eight. So this is going to give us one one over eight. And this is greater than one. Now, since equality holds, there is some redundancy. So this code Going by the interpretation of the Kraft Macmillan inequality, it contains redundancy. Okay? Now, if it contains, contains redundancy, let us check another issue here. Can we use this code? No, because one, it is not uniquely decodable because uh, and it is not instantaneous. So is that true? Now, let us look at this. Well, S3 symbol is a prefix of X4. So we know that this does not satisfy the Kraft Macmillan inequality and it is not uniquely decodable. It is not uniquely decodable. So we don't want to use this for data compression. So this is out of it. Now let us look at code C. Sigma i equal to one to four. Two to the power of minus s of i. So we have two to the power of minus one plus two to the power of minus two plus two to the power of minus three plus two to the power of minus three. So that's going to give us one over two plus one over two to the power of two plus one over two to the power of three over two to the power of three. That's one over two plus one over four plus one over eight plus one over eight. So that's going to give us seven over eight, which is less than one. Perfect. So this satisfies the Kraft Macmillan inequality, right? Because it is less than, it is not greater than, it's less than. So uh, equality holds, okay? So we know it contains some level of redundancy because inequality uh, holds here, but fine, it satisfies Kraft Macmillan inequality. But is it an instantaneous code? But we can see that S2 is a prefix of S4. So it is not, it is not an instantaneous code. And as such, it is not uniquely decodable. So if, should we attempt to compress our data using this code distribution for, for these soft symbols, then decoding will show some level of ambiguity. So we don't need this, okay? Because it is not uniquely decodable. Now, let us look at code D. So we have sigma i taking one to four, two to the power of minus li. So this is going to give us two to the power of minus one plus two to the power of minus three plus two to the power of minus three plus two to the power of minus three. So this is going to give us one over two plus one over two to the power three plus one over two to the power three plus one over two to the power three, which is one over two plus one over eight plus one over eight plus one over eight. And this is going to give us one. All right? Yeah. No, it's not one. Seven. This is going to give us... Uh, Tommy, no, this is sorry. This plus this is one over this is one over four plus one over four, that's seven over this one. Right? 
this one. It was one over four plus one over four. That's one over two plus one over two. That's going to give us one. So, Kraft Macmillan inequality holds here, but it is not an instantaneous code, and as such, it's not uniquely decodable because of the purpose condition. So, this now gives us seven over eight. All right. Yeah. This is less than one. And here we can see that it is prefix free. This is prefix free and it is uniquely decodable. So technically we can actually make use of code A and code D. Please, is this correct? Is this clear? I'd love to get your feedback, please. Is this clear before I move on? We have uh, a few minutes uh, before the class is over. Can we get your feedback? Um, can see who are those in class today. Mr. Emmanuel is in class, uh, Mr. Gospel, Mr. Ebon. So we need to get your feedback. So far, is it clear? Okay. Yeah, I can see uh, Mr. Day and sent a message. It is clear. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. it is clear. Okay. It's clear, sir. It is clear, sir. Okay. Okay, so I think we'll move on then. So now, if this is clear, so we'll just uh, talk about uh, the source coding algorithms. Now, we know the type of codes that we should use. Now, then what kind of algorithm can we adopt for, for data compression? Okay, so uh, I think now we'll just talk briefly about some of those in interesting codes that we could use for uh, data compression. Okay. So let's talk about some of the source coding algorithms. So, uh, well, we have uh, the um, we have a number of them, the Hoffman coding, which is uh, popular, and some other coding techniques uh, that uh, seem to be more reliable. But I'll just make a list here. Okay, we have Shannon, Final Elias coding. Algorithm, we have the Hoffman coding algorithm. Then uh, we have the um, Lempel Z. It's a Dutch word, instead of word, they call it Welch coding algorithm. Then we also have arithmetic coding then we also have the run length encoding then we have the uh, burrow wheeler transform which follows directly from the compression coding algorithm. Then we also have predictive coding. 
So um, two, three, four, five, seven. Oh, I have this just seven. So these are some of those uh, coding algorithms. And uh, just to run through them before we look at one or two examples, then uh, for the Shannon, uh, Shannon Fanon Elias uh, coding algorithm, uh, well, this utilizes the cumulative distribution function uh, to allot code words, okay? And it's usually not optimal. So it's not, it's not an optimal uh, source coding algorithm. Now, the Hoffman um, coding algorithm uh, is a variable length encoding algorithm, okay, that assigns shorter codes to more frequent symbols and longer codes to less frequent symbols. So we are going to see how that works. Then the Lempe-Zivelt algorithm is more like a, a dictionary based compression algorithm, okay, based compression algorithm that replaces repeated occurrences of data with some references to the previously encountered sequences. So in that way, it reduces the um, redundancy. Now for the arithmetic coding system, this usually is more efficient than the Hoffman coding scheme, only that it, it comes with, uh, there's a trade-off. You know, it, uh, it has some, uh, uh, it has a higher level of uh, computational complexity. Let's put it that way. So in this algorithm, it maps a string of symbol into a single floating point number, okay, in a defined interval. Then we also have the run length. So for the run length encoding system, uh, let's say it's a simple form of data compression where the sequences of the same data value are stored as a single data value and count rather than the original sequence. So there's a single data representation for uh, the symbols rather than uh, the original sequence that uh, is used for that. Now for the uh, Burrow Wheeler, we say this is uh, a reversible transformation. That rearranges the character in a string to improve compressibility. Okay, so uh, well for this. Uh, is more like a processing step in the compression algorithm, okay? In this compression algorithm. Then for the predictive coding system, well, it's more like a learning system. So it predicts the value of the current symbol based on the previously encoded symbol. And there it encodes the difference between the predicted value and the actual value, you know? So in that way, it's able to reduce the level of redundancy. Well, these are some, and we also have some novel uh, new uh, encoding uh, system, which you could review in your, in your class assignment, you know, and probably come up with some uh, technique. Probably you want, to, you want to encode some of those things, so we could say, well, uh, who knows, you may just end up designing a more optimal code. But uh, just before we round up, let us try to uh, see how optimal some of these codes are, okay? So let us consider, uh, okay, let us give a distribution, for instance. Uh, da, 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 da. I want to give a particular code distribution. So let's assume we have, um, can I get an example here? Mm, okay, so let's assume we have a symbol or uh, some symbols. A, B, C, D, and E having the probability distribution P of X or P of A, B, C, D as 0 0.4, 0 0.19, 0 0.16, 0 0.15, 
and then 0 0.1. So let us start with uh, the Shannon funnel. So uh, let's see if um, I can rule a line here. So I think this would be a good place to stop. Uh, let's divide the board. So this is the uh, probability mass function for these symbols. And then let us see how some of these algorithms work. Uh, now, if we take Shannon, Shannon, Fanon, Elias algorithm, let's look at this algorithm. So what does it say? So um, here, the first point is that you have to list the source symbols in order of decreasing probabilities. Well, we have these uh, notes, uh, uh, this algorithm also uh, explained exhaustively in in uh, in some of your lecture in your lecture note online. So you want to play with that. So so the first point here is that we want to list the source symbols in order of decreasing probability. So well, that has been done for us. So we just place it again: 0 0.4, 0 0.19. 0 0.16, 0 0.15, and then 0 0.1. So after doing that, then we'll partition the set into two sets first. So we're going to partition into two sets that are as close to equal probable as possible, and then we assign a zero and one to them. So now we want to divide this into two parts. So the point is, if I should add 0 0.4 with 0 0.15, so I'm going to get what? So if I should do that partitioning, so it means that in this instance, let's change the color. So it means that in this instance, I'm going to have 0 0.59, 59. Then in this instance, I'm going to have 0 0.41. So at least that is near equal probable because if I should add 0 0.1 plus this, that would be 0 0.25. So that would not be more like an equal distribution. So it is near equal probable. So I'm going to partition this way. So I have divided them into two equal halves, but not necessarily equal. So this is almost 0 0.5, 0 0.59. So that's fair enough. So once we do this, what is said, then we assign zero to the upper half and one to the lower half. So then we are going to assign zero to this point, zero to this point, that's the upper half in this first uh, partitioning, then one, one, one to these singles. Okay, now the next thing now is to partition again. So we'll keep partitioning till it says continue the process in part two, each time partitioning the set with as nearly equal probable values until further partition is impossible. Well, here we just have just two possibilities. So we can't partition beyond that. So this is not zero. One. So in this case, we can actually partition this into 0 0.1. 0 0.16, then 0 0.16 plus 0 0.1 will give us 0 0.25, 0 0.16. That's nearly equal because uh, this plus this will be larger than 0 0.1, it will be far, far greater than 0 0.1. But so if we split this way, then this is 0, then this is 1, 1. Now, the only part that we can split is this, which is 0, 1. So from this, it means that having these symbols, A, B, C, D, E, okay, coming, with the probability distribution, so this is the symbols, right? Then we have the probability distribution, the P of, say, P of A, B, C, D, right? That's 0 0.4, 0 0.19, 0 0.16, 0 0.15, 0 0.15, and then this is 0 0.1. Now, the code word for 0 0.4 from this is 0, 0, right? Is 0, 0 for this, is 0, 0. So now the code word length, let's say the code word, let's say code word of A, B, C, D, for this, for A is 0, 0. For B is 0, 1. For C, it is 1, 0. 
for D, it is one, one. For E, it is zero, one. So with this, we can actually check the code efficiency. But for us to be able to do that, we know that the code efficiency is the ratio of the entropy to the expected length, right? And we know that the entropy is the same as uh, sigma P of X log one over P of X, right? So then what is going to be the entropy? Let us quickly run through that. So the entropy here would be 0 0.4 log one over 0 0.4, the probability distribution plus 0 0.19 log one over 0 0.19 plus 0 0.16 log one over 0 0.16 plus 0 0.15 log one over 0 0.15 plus 0 0.1 log one over 0 0.1. Now recall that this is in base two, right? They are all in base two, in base two. So we need to do uh, change of base conversion, right, to base 10. So it means that whatsoever you have here, so that would be, so let's just explode this uh, in case you want to punch your calculator. So if we explode this, for instance, so it means that this now, if you want to use your calculator, if it doesn't resolve this in base two, so in base 10, this is going to be 0 0.4 times log to base 10, 1 over 0 0.4 divided by log 2 base 10, right? So you're going to do this for all of them, then add everything together, then our entropy, H of X, should give us what? Mm. Our entropy should give us 2.15 bits per single right now we are going to do the same thing for uh, the uh, expected length okay now we know that let's wipe this we know that the expected length that's uh, l of C is the same as the expected value of uh, of uh, the code word length S of S. Okay, so this is now going to give us for this the probability value is zero point four times what's the length of this code word? Okay, this is two, right? This is two. Coming, uh, da, 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 there's a problem here because code D is one one zero and code E is one one one, right? It's one 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 one, right? Yeah, that's what we have. This one one one, this is one one zero, this is one zero zero one zero zero. So, so this now we give us uh, two, two times what? That's 0 0.4 times two plus 0 0.19 times two, 0 0.19 times two, that's the length, two bits, plus 0 0.16 times two bits, plus 0 0.15 times three, that's the length plus 0 0.1 times three. So whatsoever we have here, the length is going to give us, uh, what's that? 2.25 bits per symbol, right? And now the code efficiency for this is going to be 2.15 divided by 2.25, and that's going to give us uh, 0 0.956, which will give us 95.6%. Okay? 
using the Shannon funnel. So let us quickly compare with the uh, Hoffman coding, and then uh, we could wrap up the class. Now, in Hoffman coding, we actually perform two, two major steps, uh, reduction and splitting. So in the first case, what we have to do is to arrange these two in order of decreasing probability. So that's uh, zero. So we want to do Hoffman. Hoffman coding algorithm. So it says, well, let us leave this in order of decreasing probability. That's 0 0.4. 0 0.19, 0 0.16, 0 0.15, 0 0.1. And then reduce the two least probable symbols to one symbol with probability. So we need to add these two together. Now, if we add these two together, what are we going to get? We are going to get 0 0.24. So that's 0 0.24. We have to arrange again in order of uh, decreasing probability. So that will definitely come above 0 0.19, so this is 0 0.24, 24, right? If we, is it 24, 25, 25, 1, 25, 0 0.25, yeah. Then this goes above it still, that is 0 0.4. Then this now has to come under, this is 0 0.19. Then this also, comes under, that is 0 0.16, or that in that manner. Then we need to add up these two again in that manner, and that is going to give us 0 0.35. So that goes above 0 0.25. So we have 0 0.35. So this also is above it because it's higher, 0 0.4. Then this comes below 0 0.25. So then we add up this again. So that's going to give us 0 0.6. So that goes above this time because it's higher now, 0 0.6. And then we bring this under, that is 0 0.4. So once we add these two together, it should give us one because total sum of total probability must be equal to one. So it means this distribution is correct. So once we've done all of this ordering and all of that, then we start assigning zeros and one. That's under the split. Okay, the splitting part of the algorithm. So add zero and one to the two final symbols and walk backward. So this time we are now going to add, let's change the color. This is going to have zero. No, no, no. I want to change the color. So, so this is going to have zero, one. Okay, so we are walking backward. So looking at this, this particular part traces this way. So this has one, and it goes this way, this has one, so we know this has one all through, okay? Mm -hmm. But now, going by this tray, so this comes this way all the way, so we have, these two symbols have zero, zero. Okay, so by the algorithm, we now have to add zero, one to it again, okay? So let us change the color. So we have to add zero, one at this junction. Okay, and looking at this, so this trace this way. So it means this code have the same as this, okay? Because it is not a partition. Okay, there's no split there. So then uh, let's use, let's return this code zero, one, right? And now this also comes this way. So it means this branch has zero, zero. So we can now place a zero, zero. Then we now have to add zero, one as a new addition here, okay? And going by this, you observe that this zero, zero is the same as this because there's no uh, reduction here. Then this is the same as this. So let's just complete those branches. So we have, zero here, we have zero here. Then this is zero. So I think there, there's, there seems to be a, um, a part that is not very clear. Yes, around where your cursor is now. Okay, yeah, there's a, in fact, there's, there's a little challenge here. So we have zero. Yeah, double zero, zero. zero. Yeah, double, double zero, yeah. You're right. So we need to correct this. Thank you for that observation. 
So this double zero, so that at this point, we now have to add a zero one, right? This is a new branch. Yes, yes sir. Yeah, we now have to add a zero one. So that this now, it means you are following, that sounds good. So then this is zero, zero, then we have zero, one, right? So this is complete. But now this is zero, one. So this zero, one trace up to this point. So both branches have uh, da, 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 zero, one, right? This is zero, zero. Then it has one. Then we now have to add the new distribution. Okay, which of the colors? Let's use the red. Zero, one. Okay. So uh, going by this, it means that we now have a new distribution for A, B, C, D, E. So we also have 0 0.4. 0 0.19, 0 0.16, 0 0.15, then uh, 0 0.1, right? And now let's look at the code words we have using uh, Hoffman. Here we have one, here we have 0, 0, 0, here we have 0, 0, 1, here we have 0, 1, 0, and then here we have 0, 1, 1, right? And now we already know the entropy is 2.15. So how about the length? The code word length here is going to give us uh, the sum of the probability distribution of each code word times the code word length. Uh, let's, let's stay by the convention we established from our definition, P sub i, L sub i. So this is now going to give us 0 0.4 times one plus 0 0.19 times three, plus 0 0.16 times three, plus 0 0.15 times three, plus 0 0.1 times three. So this is gonna give us what? Uh, this is gonna give us 2.2, uh, 2, right? 2.2. Uh, let's say bits per symbol. So in this case, using Hopma, the code efficiency is going to be 2.2 .2 divided by 2.15, the entropy. And this is going to give us about 0 0.977, which is the same as 97.7%. Now in comparison, you see that uh, the level of redundancy here, using Hoffman coding is less than uh, in Shannon Fano Elias algorithm. And as such, we say that the Hoffman code is an optimal code because here we could achieve 97.7% against 95.6% using the uh, Shannon Fano Elias algorithm. So uh, technically speaking, uh, we want to prefer the uh, Hoffman coding algorithm over um, uh, Shannon Fano Elias algorithm. I'm seeing our uh, MPEG and all some of those uh, novel recent uh, compression algorithms, they use Hoffman, okay? I think this is a good place to stop. I think we, we are just about, we are about two hours into our class already. So any question, please, uh, before we call it a day. Any question? I'd love to hear your voice, okay, to see if we have any questions. Good evening, sir. Uh, very good evening, sir. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Last week I was not able, or the last class I was not able to join. No, it's fine. It's was fine. Actually, was actually down. Oh, so sorry for that. So I checked the YouTube to see if the class was loaded and I couldn't see any lecture on that. 
So I don't know what we can do to make up for that. Uh, okay. That yeah, uh, well, we decided not to upload because uh, we have uh, our old notes online still, which is, uh, we really don't have new information. We didn't uh, update with uh, new information. So uh, what we have in our previous videos should be sufficient. But this, we have new information, we'll upload it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I can use the previous lecture. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, okay. Since uh, that's about the only question we've got, I think uh, we've come to the end of the class.